So uh, thanks, thanks for the invitation to come here. Uh, the organization was a very efficient organization. It's a pleasure to be here in, uh, in Japan again. Uh, beautiful country, and I was uh, enjoying previous days. Uh, now I need to kind of uh, concentrate and, uh, and try to give you my, my view on, on, on something that is very big, which is the emergence of a biosphere. It's a, it's a, it's a huge uh, word for me. But I'm going to agree with what Eric uh, said in the morning and, and part of it, at least. Uh, I think that I'm going to concentrate more on what I think are the main players in, uh, in this game and the emergence of a, of, a, of a biosphere, which are cells, microorganisms, okay? And uh, how we could, what, what kind of models do we have of the emergence of these, of these types of systems? There are very complex uh, molecular... Uh, Machines, molecular, they are factories of, of molecules, okay? In a, and they, it's not just a question of having molecules together, uh, it's a question of, you know, the spatial organization, the heterogeneity that you have there, okay? So it's not, it's not, it's more complex than just have, having a bag of, of, of molecules like we can see here uh, in these metabolic pathways, uh, but, uh, this metabolism is a vectorial metabolism. This is one of my, my, uh, my messages today, that when we talk about the, the game of life, the game that those players uh, play, okay, uh, in carrying out the metabolism, metabolism takes place in heterogeneous conditions in where different phases uh, are involved, not just water solution, okay? And uh, so there are some areas uh, in the cell that can be treated as a pool, but some other areas in which the, the crowding is, is so big that you have to treat them as, as gel. And, and also you have, of course, membranes. And I'm going to, most of the, of the talk, I'm, I'm going to be focusing on how, you know, you have to start with chemistries that get coupled with membrane processes and, uh, and uh, uh, let's say, transport processes that involve different phases, not just water solution. Okay, so that's going to be one of my... Uh, so when we, we go from this complexity that we see in, in living organisms, in, in microorganisms, and we try to go down either f f from the point of view of the physiology that could be a minimal cell, we have some news this year about how could a minimal cell uh, look like, although we, don't, we haven't learned enough about what uh, uh, one third of those genes uh, uh, actually code for, and we, there is a lot of work to be done from here to un understand uh, the functions of a lot of the components here, but we are making progress in the uh, you know top-down approaches, uh, and also when we do uh, phylogenies and comparative phylogenies, trying to uh, see what kind of, what kind of the root of tree, the the root of that tree of life that we know that uh, uh, the result of the evolutionary uh, process that took place on the Earth. Okay, we see that there are different features, and this is one of the uh, fundamental, um, uh, let's say, advances from molecular biology last century, okay, to see that there's so much in common in all uh, types of living organisms. Uh, and different people have focused on different features uh, that make us, uh, all these features that make us be sure that there was a common origin for all the living beings that, we, that inhabit the Earth today, okay. And uh, traditionally, probably because of the uh, influence of molecular biology, the question was um, articulated in this way. Were the people were focusing on, on the biopolymers, the, the critical biopolymers, and these are DNA or proteins. And when ribozymes were found, we thought that we had, a, 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 let's say, an answer for the origin, and it was RNA. Okay, but the focus was probably too much on biopolymers, okay? Um, trying to get chemical shortcuts to biopolymers, okay? And hoping that natural selection would do the job once you get to an RNA world or a pre-RNA world, okay? So I'm very critical. I mean, the, I think the RNA had a, a, um, a role to play at some point, but I'm, I'm rather critical with the traditional way of conceiving the RNA world just as RNA molecules, population of RNA molecules. Uh, so even if we get self-replicating molecules, imagine that, you know, I don't know, Jerry Joyce manages it some, someday. 
We have the problem of origins of RNA. Where does it come from? What kind of scenario? Uh, what kind of organization? What kind of system does it come from? And uh, also, if, if we manage the synthesis, imagine that John Sutherland goes uh, forward and, and you can actually solve the problem of the origin of RNA and you have RNA populations. Where do RNA molecules and natural selection lead you to? Okay, and there are, this is a big assumption that they will lead you to a, to a cell, uh, a metabolizing cell, okay? But if you get already there, why do you need a metabolizing cell uh, to begin with, right? Uh, so I think that there are many, many problems with these assumptions about the RNA world, and I, I'm, trying, I'm trying to come up with a completely different uh, uh, approach to the problem of origins, okay? Uh, and this is based on a different conception of the living, okay? Instead of going for the molecules of life, the biopolymers, and trying to get uh, chemical, synth synthetic shortcuts, shortcuts to those molecules. Uh, I think about life in a more kind of systemic way, okay, a systems approach, and that's that comes from a, from a definition that I'm gonna I'm not gonna fight for today. If you want, we can discuss it in the in the questions uh, time. But uh, the most important uh, thing about this slide is that we conceive of life as a systems property. Therefore. It's a combination. We shouldn't focus on any each of these mo molecules, right? It's an organization. It's a complex organization, and we should also also take into account this dynamic and complex organization when we simplify things uh, in the origins of life models. Okay, that's the that's the basic. Uh, so this type of a scheme that I'm presenting here. Uh, is changing. I think there's a lot of protocellular kind of modeling these days, both uh, empirical and, uh, and computational. And we are becoming more and more aware that probably that, you know, if you take a, a different type of conception of life, you probably need to put metabolism and compartmentalization that was thought about as later latecomers in the origins of life, you had to put, push them uh, towards earlier and earlier uh, stages, okay? so. Regardless of what Jack Sostak says, don't pay attention to that paper. Uh, uh, your conception of life, this is the first home message for, for younger, maybe, uh, researchers. Your conception of life plays a fundamental role when designing your research line. You can keep it hidden or you can make it explicit if you make the effort of, of, of coming out with, a, with a, uh, let's say, a definition, explicit definition. But... Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's the way it is. In fact, I, I exchanged some emails with, uh, five years ago with, with Jack about this, and he told me that he wrote the, uh, the paper a bit in, in anger. So I think there are, let's say, this is absolutely clear that it, depending on how you conceive of the living phenomenon, you're going to do some things in the lab or some others, okay? He wanted to stress that you need to do things in the lab, you do, do the experiments, okay, but then you should also have in your head at least a clear definition, or at least make yourself, uh, let's say, clear with what, what is your conception and make it clear also for the other researchers because it's, uh, it's a way. So, for example, this is a very different uh, type of way of conceiving life, Gantis, right? okay? In which you have a more complex type of setting, more dynamic, less just, okay? So, when we make models of origins of life, okay, we are all, uh, all the advantage of us working in origins of life is we, we can simplify, but we have to be very careful in the way we simplify, okay? And maybe going to one type of molecule was not the right strategy, okay? We need to go to a diversity of molecules, okay, to begin with, okay? So this is the, the, the core idea of a, of, a, of a new perspective on origins of life, uh, which is the systems chemistry perspective. I think that Martha, I don't know Martha, but she will speak more. Okay, uh, you are Martha, okay. Uh, she will speak more about this and Sebrem probably tomorrow as well. But I don't, uh, I, I would like to just touch upon uh, a couple, of, a few, let's say, um, uh, research, uh, 
the results of the research labs that are going in this direction. Uh, the first one is uh, John Sutherland's, and uh, he's finding that hydrogen chemistry could be a common chemistry for the formation of a lot of precursor, really precursor molecules uh, that, you know, give you a suit of initial compounds that could be uh, underlying uh, those initial stages. Okay, of course, is he just does the synthesis of it. Um, he couples it with, with geochemistry uh, to some extent, and there are a lot of criticisms that you can make it, but I think this, this type of work is very interesting. We can maybe discuss it longer later. Okay, uh, the other uh, group that I would like to highlight is Ralph's group, who is uh, showing that in principle you can run metabolisms without enzymes, okay, uh, present, okay, in Archean type of conditions. Uh, more recently, we at last have a model system that is not the belusov sautinsky reaction. We have uh, chemical complexity, oscillations, and these kind of things, working with uh, organic compounds that are relevant for origins uh, of, of metabolism, okay, like amides or uh, thiols and these kind of things, okay. But the problem here is that you, you, you work on the system and you try to find parameter space where you get this type of, of complex behavior without really an autonomous uh, control on boundary conditions. Okay, so this is this kind of setting here that you have here, right, is pushing the system with some syringes in it to, towards that area of parameter space where you get this uh, complex interesting behavior, okay? The idea here and, and life on Earth shows us that there is a lot of self-organization in, in, in living processes, but the, the way that self those self-organization processes are controlled is, is an autonomous way, okay? So how does this begin, okay? So I think that the beginning of it, seeing the role that membranes have in, or in, 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 in biological systems, of course, biomembrane is a very complex type of boundary condition, right? But you could have um, a relatively, uh, uh, this is a much easier type of, of, of system that you can get just in water, okay? You have a vesicle here, and I, the idea of the, um, the idea that I'm gonna try to uh, put forward today is that we have to envision the whole process of origins of life as a, as a process of coevolution between uh, reaction dynamics, chemistry, kinetics, Okay, and other types of processes that have to do with spatial control and, and different types of phases, okay? Uh, and this, uh, let's say, a colloidal type of chemistry, a, a messy chemistry, okay? Like, uh, so this is the type of a scenario that I'm going to, uh, so this is just oleic acid in water, okay? And you get these beautiful vesicles, okay? So, we combining self-assembly, this is self-assembly, right? With complex chemistry, see what Epstein and these people did, just, you know, uh, or I could, I, I mentioned here Epstein, but it could go all the way down to Turing, and you can see uh, the, the, the potential of combining chemistry reactions with uh, a spatial uh, movement with diffusion, in, in particular, if you put constraints on diffusion and you control the diffusion rates of the system, I think that there is a lot that you can gain from it, okay? So this is uh, the type of environment, the type of context, okay, where I think functional relationships should start building up, okay? And this is in fact where natural selection could actually uh, have, uh, let's say, more of, of, of operational power to uh, actually because you need a phenotypic, phenotypic space that is wide enough, okay, for natural selection to operate. If you're just operating with molecules, a phenotypic space is very, very uh, limited, okay, and you probably you will run into many, many bottlenecks. But if you start from a scenario where you have, you know, uh, wider um, possibilities in terms of molecules playing different types of, of functions in this type of system, I think that that's where natural selection is gonna be working, okay? So it's very important to start with, uh, with precursors, okay? And talking about precursors and the prebiotic 
uh, plausibility of those precursors. Uh, I'm going to show you the type of work that we're doing now with what I think is the, the most um, uh, generally acknowledged uh, 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 molecules that have a, let's say a wider uh, support uh, in terms of the uh, prebiotic plausibility of those. And then some of them are amphiphiles, okay, and amino acids, okay. So we start with really very basic uh, uh, molecular building blocks, okay. And the one piece of work that I'm going to show you uh, from our lab, uh, in the la it was published last year, okay, it has to do with this. You have a, an amino acid, okay, and in principle, if you do the reaction in, in uh, you uh, activate the amino acid, okay, and you create an oxazolone, for example, okay, and you, you have this reaction that was very well characterized by Robert Pascal and, and his team in Montpellier, okay, in which you, ha you add another uh, amino acid and you have the D-peptide, and they were trying to see what was the, uh, if there was any enantiomeric excess, uh, and they found that there was a preference for L forms in water solution, okay? So that was a well-characterized reaction that they were working with, and we, we uh, uh, got in collaboration with them, and we asked them to, uh, to try to do the same reaction, but in the presence of, of vesicles, okay? And, uh, for example, this is, a, this is a graph that summarizes the type of, of results that we got, in which you have decanoic acid here, which is a fatty acid, that self-assembles into one of those vesicles that uh, I was showing you, or similar vesicles that I was showing you in the previous graph. Okay, so you see that as you increase the concentration of decanoic acid, okay, you get to the point, to get to a point when you have a, like a phase transition here, or a, a change in the behavior, and this is actually the, the point, the crit what is called the critical aggregation concentration, is the point in the concentration of the fatty acid in which it saturates the, the, the water solution and it starts forming those vesicles. Okay, so something happens when, when the vesicles are formed, right? Below here, you just have monomer in, in water solution, okay? So it's, it's uh, and above here, you have the vesicles, okay? So also we see that the... Uh, the astronomic ratio here goes down, so the effects for L that we saw in, in water solution when the concentration of is zero are somehow uh, counteracted, okay? And we have a more heterochiral type of, of, of uh, result here. But the important thing is that the yield of the reaction, okay, the yield of the reaction goes up and quite uh, two or three fold, okay? So we see that in the presence of those vesicles, uh, somehow, the formation of the vesicle helps in the uh, uh, reaction yield of the formation of a, of a D-peptide, dipeptide, okay? So we checked it, and we saw that um, we did many different types of controls, and instead of using, photo, um, instead of using fatty acids, we used uh, uh, phospholipids, also negatively charged phospholipids. We didn't get the result. So the result was a specific for fatty acids, okay, so which are the precursors of phospholipids, okay? So uh, we also did some experiments in, in organic solution, and we saw that the checking uh, for uh, different types of, of uh, um, different types of, of, of systems here, without the formation of the vesicles, vesicle formation only takes place in water, okay? So when you are in organic solvents, there are no vesicles, but there is an effect, okay? And the effect, based on these results, is, is, is related to the polar head more than the length of the, of the fatty acid, okay? So there's something that is happening that is somehow related to the formation of the vesicle, but not only, okay? So that's why we call it the double row, okay? Because it's important that they generate a kind of hydrophobic environment for the reaction to take place, okay? But at the same time, there is catalysis happening, okay? So uh, it's, uh, in fact, through some other experiments that I don't have time to go into, uh, the details of them, um, we showed that the, it's probably a, 
uh, an acid-based ca acid -based catalysis happening at the, at the interface there, okay? So first thing, to provide a uh, hydrophobic environment for the reaction to take place. Second, acid-based catalysis to actually help in that reaction. Okay, so um, second, I said first, but it's second. Second take-home message uh, is worth trying with precursors, okay? Uh, instead of using phospholipids, we used fatty acid and it worked better. Uh, instead of using a protein, you are, we are using, I don't know, I know, it's a dip, dipeptide. Dip, dipeptide. It's a very uh, humble uh, molecule, okay? But I think it's very important to continue working with really uh, low complexity molecules. Um, if you work with, with the polymers, the polymers I think are the result of the whole process of of uh, origins of life, or the biopolymers, okay? So it's important to work with biopolymers to know the properties of those molecules, but I don't think, let's, I'll, I'll be a bit provocative here, I don't think you are doing anything in terms of origins of life if you're working with the results, what I think are the results, the molecules that are the result of the process, okay? So, um, enough. <laughs> I could, I could uh, go a bit farther there, but uh, anyway. Um, so, uh, luckily, the SOSTAC and other groups are, are working in si on similar lines uh, as well. Even if uh, in very, this is really a new, a new, new work that is very interesting and very related. Instead of having the oxazolone as we were doing, they are doing the NC NCA. Okay. Uh, pathway to activate uh, the amino acid to get a di dipeptide, okay? Um, but maybe it's probably because Jack Sostak didn't actually work en hard enough on a definition of life that he's doing all this very interesting work, and I don't know if you've noticed, but in uh, all the abstract, he needs to mention RNA, RNA, RNA. Even if he's doing very interesting stuff on other things that I have, don't have anything to do with the RNA world, okay? But, that's why sometimes it's good to do some conceptual clarification. Uh, maybe your, our obsessions, we, at least we, we, we make them clear, okay, <laughs> from the beginning, okay. Okay, so um, to start, how much time do you have? Uh, I'm still green, okay, I'm gonna, so I'm still okay, 10 minutes or so, okay. So I'm gonna show you another, instead of experimental part, I'm going to do something that work that is computational, okay? But again, in the same lines, okay? So the idea here is that we would have some sort of functional, initial functional integration, okay, of precursor molecules in which we don't only take into account kinetic control, but also spatial control, and if possible, also thermodynamic viability, but this is complicated, okay? Uh, there are some people, this is a, a very interesting exception of uh, synthetic biology. I don't know if you've heard about the work of uh, Neil uh, de Barayan, okay, but very interesting work related precisely with this. Chemistry, uh, starting with precursors, okay, and trying to move from chemistry towards biology, okay. If we use biological uh, uh, molecules, we are not taking this step from chemistry, right? Um, and here they also couple to some extent spatial control with kinetic control, so a, a catalyst and, and a memory. So in order to move forward, we also, um, in tr tr trying to understand the systems, we, we use uh, a platform that was developed by, by my colleague uh, Fabio Avelli, and uh, I won't go into the details of this, but basically what we are doing is trying to understand what, what are the implications of having a reaction chemistry inside here, uh, that is actually compartmentalized, okay? And in what sense the compartment can be a nightmare for the chemistry or it could help lead the chemistry somewhere else, I think closer and closer to biological systems, okay? So sometimes the compartment can, can be uh, uh, counteractive in the sense of, of killing a chemistry that in, in water solution could be interesting, but some other times, and a, a, a dull, a, a rather dull uh, chemistry can become very interesting in a compartmentalized uh, system 
if you take the dynamic properties of the compartment into account, okay? So imagine that you have a proto-metabolic type of cycle. This is, would be a la Kaufman, this could be a la Rosen, okay? This could represent a simplified version of a, of a sorry, uh, this would be, I know that it's a bit too, too much saying this, but th this could be an autotrophic type of mo simplified model of an autotrophic uh, meta protometabolism, okay? And this would be a hetero, uh, like a heterotrophic type of, of, of metabolism, and we encapsulate them and we compare what happens to them in different conditions. Okay, we do uh, basically what we are going to be using here is the fact that this set of reactions can synthesize, okay, a lipid or amphiphile molecule that is going to get integrated into the, into the compartment, okay? And by changing, so this reaction or this one here will create, uh, will synthesize a, a lipid that will go into the, into the membrane here and the membrane will change its composition. By changing its composition, it will change its properties among other things, is permeability, okay? And the idea here is that by checking experimentally the permeability of the system, okay, we see that mixed uh, membranes made of mixed uh, components, okay, have a higher permeability, okay? And in fact, if you are, in this case, it was lauric acid with the DLPC that we ch we're checking, you see here that if you have a mixed system here, the permeability it has a non-linear non uh, behavior and it's in the middle, somewhere in the middle here for mixed composition membranes where you get a higher permeability. So the idea is that we, we made use of this, we run the simulations and we saw that indeed when you start, imagine that you start with a fatty acid vesicle, the initial scaffolding, okay, and then there is a chemistry that is able to synthesize a slightly more complex amphiphile that goes into the membrane. That will uh, change the, the, the properties of the membrane, will increase its permeability, and that will help, for example, these nutrients here get into the, into the system, and it will make the, the metabolism run faster, okay? And it will divide faster as well. So that's what we see here in this graph here. Both for those, the two types of, of metabol proto-metabolism, you have an increase in the reaction rates here and a decrease in the uh, reproduction time, okay? So a change like that could be a selective advantage in a scenario like this, okay? So there are many features that you can play with in a scenario like this in which uh, you, you're being more dynamics and, and you're taking into account more the, uh, the organization of the system. So I'm orange already. Um, so let's try, st start wrapping up. Um, so compartmentation does not make life easy, and we have other, other papers in which we see how compartmentation can be a pain, okay? Uh, life is complex, so the sooner the better. Um, red already, okay. So let me reconcile with Jack before we, I finish um, and uh, say that I agree completely with this, okay? Although protocellular structure poses more problems initially, it is actually simpler to solve these problems up front than leave them till later when they could become completely intractable. That's, a, that's, a, that's what I think is happening. Okay, you need to deal with compartments first because otherwise it's gonna be uh, impossible. Okay, so I leave you with these nice bubbles in which uh, we think that uh, go together with, I mean, there is a lot of reflection and conceptual uh, developments as well that go together with this. We think we can start with functions, we, we, we should go to regulation and we should go to information, but this is too long a story for today. Uh, we, need to have in, we need to take into account the physiological type of cone and the evolutionary cone at the same time, okay? So this is the type of uh, idea that when I say that origins of life should be taken as a, as a process of development of protocell uh, systems, we start with very simple vesicles, and uh, this leads you to a different evolutionary cone here with, and then as the, as the vesicles change and they become more complex, the evolutionary cone also 
changes. Okay, so two dimensions have to be taken into account. And uh, to finish, I uh, so it's not just a question of, of having just the cell, but what the, pro the protocellular and the individual idea, but it's also taken into account as, as the different stages and origins of life unfold, there's, there's going to be an unfolding of different, um, let's say, interactions at the collective level between those protocells, okay? So the, the scenario is complex, okay? Um, but I think we have to face it. And, uh, and finishing now, right, with this quote that I think is inspiring uh, Eric's work these days, uh, following Morovitz, of course, uh, sustained life is a property of an ecological system rather than a single organism or a species. So thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm ready to take questions. Sorry. Okay, so we have time for questions and discussion. Thanks, Kafao. Nice as ever. Um, the so, how do you define then a uh, compartment? Because a lot of focus in a lot of people, a lot of labs is on bilayers with an aqueous inter, inter internal, but these are, in my experience, certainly about the most difficult ones to handle. It's much easier to do micelles or coacervates. It's even simpler still. Has to is there, in your view, a progression from? any of those structures towards the sort of cell-like bilayer type uh, assemblies we see these days? Um, okay, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, I think the, the micelles and other types of, of supramolecular structures would be around, okay? So also for the dynamics of vesicles, micelles are very important for different types of, so, Colloidal systems are, are complicated, and it's not just a single type of, of supramolecular chemistry, uh, supramolecular structure that I'm... But the, the reason why I focus on, on vesicles is because they give you a continuity line with biology that, I mean, because the thing is, when you, you have to have a one leg in chemistry and another leg in biology, okay? And uh, I think that we need to, you know, bring the two together. And whereas I think that there are many processes that could be very interesting to explore in a colloidal system that is very different from a cell, okay? There are some other things that we should explore that are closer to the cell, okay? And that's why I focus my research on, on vesicles, being aware that, I don't know, coacervates, for example, could be an option initially and some things could happen there, but my, let's say, my research uh, bias is more for trying to get closer to, to a cell, in a sense, okay? And so I agree that maybe vesicles could be initially, but complicated to deal with. Uh, because nobody solved how to divide vesicles adequately, and you can, and no. this is trivial in a micelle and a coacervate. Yeah, but, yeah, 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 I mean, vesicles adequately, okay, the division of vesicles is complicated, and, and uh, I can show you, um, our cells do that, okay, so, this paper here, we're trying to deal with that, okay, how you could get the kinetic conditions so that you have a chemistry that is within the compartment that makes the compartment grow, and what are the the, uh, the conditions for the compartment to get, you know, division? So we, I know it's hard, uh, but uh, we're trying to get there. And uh, at some point, we life got there. Which is the exact route to there? I don't know. You have an alternative. I mean, I, I discuss these things with people like like, like working more coacervate type of, of and how do you get from coacervate to the cell? It's not it's not trivial at all either, or from my cells. Thanks. Yeah. So why do you think it's easier to start with vesicles? Because I... I, I never said easier. You, easier earlier than later. Earlier than later, but easier, I didn't say. No, okay. So you think it's easier to have them later? What are the benefits of them early? I actually think it's much easier to get life started without vesicles. 
without vesicles. I think they came later. Like the upsell. Like you are referring to the upsell of these kind of models. In upsell, it's a, it's a model about having some vesicle and then things happening. No, no outside, vesicle. Outside, yeah, yeah, well, or some kind of compartment. And no compartment. No compartment. Okay. Only limited diffusion. Okay, limited diffusion. Yeah, because I think, you know, what There are many things that can happen in limiting diffusion. What's that? that? There are many things that can happen in limited exactly. diffusion in your surfaces and all these types of, of chemistries. I agree. Right, but I think that that solves a lot of the problems that Jack Shostak is eliciting cells for early on. But I think it makes it a lot easier for us to get life going if we don't have to compartmentalize. It could be. It depends on your... I go, I go back to my slide. It depends on whether you want to get to... Uh, let me check. Yeah, yeah, is this one? Uh, if your objective is to get to a population of genetically instructed cellular metabolisms, and look at uh, if you're really because that's something that I when I discuss with Jack, uh, Jack keeps speaking about cellular life, cellular life, cellular life. We have to uh, life and cell cell is the, I mean, it's a, it's a redundancy. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know about living, that. Living system, I, I mean, it depends. What I'm saying is, for me, it's a redundancy. For some people, if you think that life is something different uh, and life could happen without cells and life could be just a replicating a molecule or something like that, then maybe you're right. But Well, I actually think Luca didn't have compartmentalization yet. Because okay. actually the, the universality that gives us Luca has to do with nucleic acids, has to do with protein. It does not have ATP, to do with membranes. ATP synthesis? In the, same, in the same way as you're saying that for LUCA, ATP synthesis were there in LUCA. ATP synthesis? No. Well, okay, we can discuss that. Uh, LUCA had compartments. I'm quite sure about that. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed it very much, but uh, I couldn't... Uh, understand the scenario of your you know, story. You showed the four steps of uh, uh, the scenario from the pro-cell to living cells. Uh, next one. Ah, yeah, that's right. So this is work in progress, and we are, yeah, yeah but the and I, first of all, uh, I want to ask you, the, what's your stage of your research? My research is down here. I, in this and one, it's down here. Okay. 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 So, but I'm very aware of of, of, of all the difficulties that come mm. later. Uh, right. But I couldn't understand how you differentiate the first category of A from the other researchers' work. What are the with the other research? Yeah. Right. Okay. So basically, what we are taking here is a really a bottom-up approach. Yeah. Okay. In which you start with building blocks mm -hmm. that are prebiotically plausible, amphiphiles, mm -hmm. amino acids, mm -hmm. very simple things. And you start from the bottom up and you start with this type of system in which you have vesicles under what, we, what I call here environmental control in some sense, okay? There you have the scaffolding and then, right. And then you couple these with the chemistry. This is the second example that I was uh, talking about. When you have a chemistry that is coupled with vesicle uh, dynamics okay and there is a different stage and then you can have protocells with some kind of uh, more elaborated physiology here where you have not only for example template mechanisms or other types of hereditary mechanisms but you also have regulation and other types so the more complex the unit is here the the I don't know, different types of evolutionary cones appear. This is work in progress. I'm not, I'm, I'm not suggesting that I have any results related to this, okay? But, uh, and then when you have a phenotype-genotype decoupling, which would be, sorry, this bit here, at the end, okay, you would have a different type of evolution. This would be open-ended evolution. Whereas these types of evolution that you have here are not open-ended yet, okay? So this kind of a scheme, okay? So you, we need to actually characterize these evolutionary cones here where, where we, you don't have biological evolution as such. I hope you could get it. Yeah, good luck. <laughs>
Yes, uh, Kepa, you said you need a leg in biology, a leg in chem chemistry, but don't you need a leg in geology? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you try some of the experiments in A with uh, ions from minerals? Or uh, absolutely. I, 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 I agree that there has to be three legs or four or whatever, <laughs> and one it has to be geology as well. So, again, um, I think it's very important to, whenever you have a system, to actually uh, put it in the context of uh, a geochemical context where it makes sense, okay? But again, my bias is a bit uh, to try to understand biological organization and how that biological organization is started. And uh, I think there are many uh, things that play functional roles that come from geo, okay? But I'm I'm kind of interested in how those things got integrated into these other dynamics that is the biological dynamics. And, but it's not a satisfactory uh, uh, answer, I'm sorry. Uh, it's just a question of, of focus. I, I, but I agree completely that it should be, one leg should be also in geology. <laughs>